Hi everyone, this video is part one of the 3B series on learning for AP Psychology students. This particular video will focus on the components of classical conditioning. As you can see on our unit outline, we are in the second part of unit three, which is part B. And this section specifically focuses on concepts related to learning. Classical conditioning is the first topic mentioned in the learning section, and it will take up two videos. This video lesson will focus on the historical study that discovered this type of learning called classical conditioning. And the next video will go more in depth and follow up with research on classical conditioning and applications to real world scenarios. These are the three key focus questions for today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer each one of them. These are the vocabulary concepts you should take note of while watching today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So as you learned in unit zero, psychology has multiple perspectives, and these perspectives often determine the lens through which psychologists view, study, and approach different concepts. And as we move into this section about learning, you'll see that the behavioral psychologist's view on learning is very different from a cognitive psychologist or even a social psychologist. In this video, we will focus on classical conditioning, which is a product of the behavioral approach to studying learning. And behaviorists believe that psychology must be studied through observable behaviors because behaviors can be seen, documented, and measured. So in their eyes, thinking can't be measured, but behaviors can. So in the eyes of a behavioral psychologist, learning isn't acquiring knowledge. Learning is defined as a permanent change in behavior because this is tangible proof of learning. Behaviorists use the term conditioning to explain the process through which learning occurs through associations. And this is referred to as associative learning, and it simply just means that you learn through associating or connecting or pairing two things together. So in the case of classical conditioning, organisms learn to produce an involuntary behavior due to an association between two stimuli. Whereas in operant conditioning, organisms learn a voluntary behavior due to a consequence. And over the course of the next few videos, I will discuss each of these different realms of learning. Today's video will focus very specifically on classical conditioning. So it's important to go back to the beginning. Where did the discovery of classical conditioning begin? And it began with a man named Ivan Pavlov. Ivan Pavlov was a Russian physiologist who was originally studying digestion. In fact, he won the Nobel Prize in 1904 for his work on the digestive system. While he was studying dogs, he was investigating how saliva helps in the digestive process. Here's where it gets interesting. Pavlov noticed something strange during his experiments. The dogs didn't just salivate when they were eating food. They started salivating before the food arrived, like at the sound of the lab assistants entering the room or the sight of the lab assistants when they walked in. And Pavlov found this incredibly interesting. He called this surprising reaction psychic secretions because it seemed like the dogs were psychically anticipating the food and this got him curious and he set up studies to find out what was going on. So right before presenting the dog with food, Pavlov would present something completely neutral, a neutral stimulus, like the sound of a metronome and then would present the dogs with food. Over and over again, he would pair them together. The sound of a metronome, the food the sound of the metronome, the food. Over time, the dogs began salivating at the sound of the metronome, even when no food was followed. And this showed that the dogs had learned to associate the sound with the food. He tried this with other auditory stimuli, like the sound of a bell, the sound of a tuning fork, and the sound of a buzzer. He also tried flashing a light before presenting the food, and he realized that with enough pairings of the food, with the neutral stimulus that the dog would begin to anticipate all kinds of different things with the food, that the food would be coming after the presentation of this neutral stimulus. 
the moment the dogs began salivating to the neutral stimulus, it was apparent that they had learned or acquired this new behavior. And this was the moment in which they learned to associate the two together and produce this new behavior. And this was called acquisition, the moment that that new behavior was acquired. This discovery was called classical conditioning and it was groundbreaking for psychology. It showed that behaviors could be learned through associations. And this gave way for scientists to learn how organisms can acquire involuntary behaviors to neutral stimuli. Pavlov's work laid the groundwork for this new field that was going to be called the behavioral approach to psychology. And this gave birth to figures like John B. Watson, who helped us understand um, learning in, 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 in ways that we still use and draw on today. So the remainder of this video will focus on the components of classical conditioning. We will use Pavlov's groundbreaking study to look at the different components of classical conditioning. But before I move on, I want to make sure that I really clearly define what classical conditioning is. Classical conditioning is a type of associative learning when two stimuli are paired together to produce an involuntary or reflexive response. And that last part is key. The behaviors are out of your conscious control. These would be things like sweating or flinching or heart racing. And this is the type of behavior that is produced out of classical conditioning. So now let's break down the different elements of Pavlov's study. First, let's start with the expected and natural response. Initially, Pavlov's dogs were salivating while they were eating food or when food was placed in their mouth. This was expected because it is natural and normal to salivate to food. This is an involuntary reflex that you and I also have as well. When food enters the mouth, this triggers salivation. Dogs do not have to learn to salivate to food because it's a reflex. So therefore, this is an unconditioned or unlearned response or unlearned pairing. The stimulus is the object and the response is the behavior. So in this case, the unlearned or unconditioned response is salivating when food enters the mouth. And the unlearned or natural object that causes this salivation is food. Sometimes you'll see these abbreviated as UCS and UCR. So the UCS or the unconditioned stimulus is something that naturally triggers an involuntary response without any prior learning. The UCR or the unconditioned response is the natural automatic reaction or the involuntary reflex to the unconditioned stimulus. Now in Pavlov's study, he was shocked to see the dog's test tubes were filling up with saliva before they even ate food. This was shocking because salivation is an involuntary action, but the dog's brain had signaled to salivate to something other than food because they had heard a sound immediately before being presented with food. In his study, he introduced all different kinds of stimuli immediately before the food to see if he could get the dogs to salivate to all different kinds of things other than food. So let's use the metronome as an example. A metronome is a ticking timekeeper for singers or musicians. It's something completely neutral, something that a dog shouldn't produce any kind of response to at all. It's just neutral. So a neutral stimulus is paired with an unconditioned stimulus, which in this example, you now know is food. The neutral stimulus is paired repeatedly with the unconditioned stimulus over and over and over. The metronome, food the metronome, food. When the dog begins to salivate to the metronome in anticipation of the food, we say acquisition has occurred. Now he's acquired a conditioned or learned response. So now the sound of the metronome ticking is no longer neutral because it's causing the dog to salivate. So this means that the conditioned stimulus or the CS is the metronome and the conditioned response is the salivation to the metronome. So let's summarize what we have learned so far. The conditioned stimulus is something that starts out as neutral and doesn't cause a specific response at first, but after being paired with an unconditioned stimulus, it triggers a new 
and learned involuntary response. For example, the sound of the metronome becomes a conditioned stimulus when it's repeatedly paired with food. The conditioned response is the new and learned reaction to the conditioned stimulus. For example, salivating when hearing the metronome is now the conditioned or learned response. My biggest tip for students is when approaching a question about classical conditioning is to break down the words. A stimulus is an object or it's a thing. A response is a behavior. Unconditioned means unlearned or it's something that just happens naturally and conditioned means that it was learned. It doesn't happen naturally but has, has now been occurring through a learned association. Lastly, notice at the bottom of the screen, the CED note says the order of the presentation of the CS or the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus is important to successful acquisition. And this means that for successful conditioning, the CS or the metronome and the UCS, the food, need to happen really close together. Ideally, the conditioned stimulus or the metronome should come a few seconds before the UCS or the food, usually within one to five seconds. This short gap allows the subject like the dog in Pavlov's study to link the metronome with the food so that this signals that the CS means that the UCS is coming soon. Now there's a few other concepts you should know. One is extinction and extinction happens when a conditioned response like salivating to the metronome becomes weak over time because the conditioned stimulus is no longer paired with the unconditioned stimulus. So in Pavlov's experiment, after the dogs had learned to salivate to the sound of the metronome, if the sound was repeatedly presented without the food, the dogs would eventually stop salivating. So the learned response fades away because the association between the the metronome and the food is no longer being reinforced. So this is referred to as extinction because the learned behavior starts to go away. However, Pavlov's dogs demonstrated something really interesting after extinction, something he called spontaneous recovery, which is when a behavior is believed to be extinct unexpectedly and quickly returns after a period of rest or after a period of lessened response or extinction. Pavlov discovered that the salivation response would slowly stop occurring when the metronome was not presented with food directly afterwards, but after a couple of hours of rest, the dogs would start to salivate again at the sound of the metronome without the food. Now, it's important to know that this would stop again if the food was continuously not presented with the metronome, but this is an example of what's called spontaneous recovery. So let's practice what we've just learned. I would suggest doing this without referencing your notes to see what you remember. On the screen is a diagram that represents Pavlov's conditioning study before conditioning, during conditioning and after conditioning with five empty labels. The question asks, where would you place the following labels in the diagram? The CS or the conditioned stimulus, the UCS, the unconditioned stimulus, the NS, the neutral stimulus, the CR, the conditioned response, and the UCR, the unconditioned response. When you're ready, pause the video to determine where you would place these labels. And if you're ready, I'll reveal the answers so that you can check to see how you did. So let's take a look at the answers. Now, it's important to remember that the natural or unconditioned, unlearned presentation of food is the unconditioned stimulus. And this causes an unlearned response. You don't have to learn to salivate to food. This is the unconditioned response. And naturally in everyday environment, the sound of a bell should not cause a dog to do anything in particular. It's completely neutral, a neutral stimulus but you can condition a response to the bell by pairing it with something that does cause a response or food. So when paired repeatedly together, the dog can be conditioned to salivate to a completely neutral stimulus like the bell. So after conditioning, the bell becomes the conditioned stimulus because now the dog is salivating, it's producing a conditioned response to that stimulus. Now let's finish with a few multiple choice questions to review the content in today's video. Remember to pause whenever I finish the question so you can determine the answer. Question number one says, in classical conditioning, a person learns to anticipate events by 
Question number two says, every day for a week, Juliet, a two-year-old, hears a loud honk and sees a red truck pass by her house, which leads her to cry. The next week, Juliet begins crying when she sees the red truck, even though it did not honk. The red truck never honks again, but every so often, Juliet will cry when she sees this red truck and other red vehicles, although she never cries when seeing vehicles of other colors. What is the red truck in this example? This concludes today's video on the components of classical conditioning. On this screen, you should be able to check the review multiple choice answers, and then you can go through some of those key topics for today's video, answering our key focus questions, and defining our vocabulary concepts.